weekend. Hey, I just thought, man, it would be an awesome opportunity uh, for us to spend uh, a bit of time in prayer before we hop in. Sam did a fantastic job last week. Uh, Sam is our youth pastor, and he did a great job um, giving us the intro to this new series um, called Great Expectations. Like, we're going to be having these great expectations, and what does that mean? We're going to be looking at that for weeks uh, on how we actually uh, see our expectations um, kind of like grow and who we build our expectations on. But I just want to spend uh, some extended time in prayer before we actually talk about the one that we're expecting so much of. Um, and and so there's been a lot of kind of different things going on that we want to pray for. I just wanted to highlight a few just so you guys know. Right up here, I think it was maybe uh, two weeks ago or may maybe it was, it was last Sunday, uh, we, we prayed for somebody who was walking through some cancer and uh, just laid hands on her, anointed her with oil because the scriptures tell us to do that when you're sick or when you're hurting. Let the, let the elders come and, and, and uh, we'll, we'll lay hands on you and pray over you. And I wanted to say that the report came back that this particular person was cancer-free. Um, so that was awesome. Praise God for that. We praise God for that. We praise God for another um, person who's been having difficulty sleeping and has, has had a lot of pain after surgery and after uh, having us lay hands and pray on him. Again, it's not us. We're just following the biblical model of trusting God and asking uh, God to, to break forth and bring healing. Uh, this person has been experiencing um, uh, sleep and that's a real big deal uh, to this person. So we're thankful for that. And even just in my own house, like my daughter had a fever. And um, now, you know, like we're just thinking that the fever will eventually go away. And, you know, whether you pray about it or not, is that a really big deal? Well, what I'm learning is that as we step more and more into like expecting God to do like these wonderful things, he doesn't always work on our timetable. And, and some, I know that there's people out there that we're still praying for who still have cancer. I understand that. And, and, and so we're trusting God's sovereignty in all things, but we're also approaching him as a good father and a good healer. And just a simple thing like my little two-year-old it's not always simple when your two-year-old has a fever, but when, when she had a fever, I prayed over her, and then we had a couple other people praying over her, and like, it wasn't within 24 hours. It seemed to be like within 10 hours, the fever broke, and it was like she was back to normal. And so let's just not miss that God is in both the, the cancer-free report and also the fever-free report, okay? So we just got, give God a hand and say, thank you, Lord, for all those things, and... It's hard to build a culture of expectation when you don't stop and celebrate, right? And you just keep going. Um, at the same time, I know that um, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of difficulty in our world. There's a lot of um, bad news, if you will. There's a lot of brokenness uh, that's, that's still going on. And, um, you know, I think, of, I think of just even kind of what's going on even recently uh, in New York and some of the legislation that's been passed with abortion and seeing that... Uh, Abortion can happen all the way up to full term. And, um, you know, that this is the world that we live in. And we want to uh, be a voice to those who have no voice. And we want to pray and ask God on behalf of, of all of those who find themselves marginalized and, and uh, not being able to stand in the gap for themselves. And so we have highs, we have lows. This is what it means to be um, a believer in 2019. It's what it's always meant. We have highs and lows of our world. And so we just want to pray into some of those things. Um, we know that uh, we're in the midst of a government shutdown, right? Like there's, there's things that don't work right. And so we just want to pray into those things and ask the Lord uh, to be good and, and faithful like he will be. So let's pray. Father, Lord, as we think of reports that are amazing and cancer-free, we're also understanding that there are reports where cancer still remains and um, is, is slowly taking life. Lord, um, we know that you are both the God of the celebration and uh, the God of what seems to be the defeat and the, and the walls that haven't um, broken yet. And so, Father, we come to you, we ask that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit and that you would help us even in these moments to pray and, and to bring these things before you. Lord, and so we, we come and we have mixed emotions, um, Father, uh, as, as I believe you are both grieved and also celebrating. Lord, we want to we wanna say thank you. We want to say thank you for your good hand that heals and that brings relief and comfort and, um, and newness. So we thank you for being a God who does that 
Lord, we know that, that, that all life will eventually end, and so we're thankful for the temporary healings that point us to the real healing that we can all have in, in Jesus Christ that, that never runs out, uh, that is life eternal. And Father, we pray for those who still battle their diseases and their sicknesses. Lord, I think of a friend of mine who, in this church who walks through chronic illness and pain and the dynamic it has on himself and his family and his young children. I think of those who are still walking through cancer. I think of, I think of those who are walking through divorce and just, just the brokenness of, of, of our reality. And God, I pray that you would bring comfort, strength, and healing where it is needed. Father, would you do that, that we might be able to continue to lift our eyes and be reminded that you are a God who is alive and well and doing good, good things. And Father, where, where there is no healing and where, where there is um, no good report, Father, we ask that you would remind us of that better report of an empty grave that, that tells us that although there may be battles lost along the way, you have won the ultimate victory. And our hope and our faith is in the eternal life that, that you've promised through the death and resurrection of Christ. Father, I pray um, into the situation in New York. Lord, I pray into this current reality, Father. Lord, I, I, I pray uh, first for the children that this will affect. Uh, Father, uh, you, you spoke on behalf of the vulnerable and those who could not speak for themselves when you sent your son on behalf of me, a sinner who was far from you, and you, you stood in the gap for me. And, and then you tell us that we are to be a voice for the voiceless because that's what you've done in the gospel. And so we want a voice um, for the children who, who will be affected by this particular law. God, that you would bring protection, that, that your law and your love is greater than any kind of legislation that can come in. And Father, I just ask you in the name of Jesus to bring about um, safety and protection and, and birth of those children who um, might be in the minds uh, of some to, to be aborted. God, I pray that you would change hearts and you would change minds. I pray you bring protection and life where there's scheduled death. Father, I pray for the mothers and the fathers who would be in a situation where, where they would actually consider that. God, I pray that you would have mercy on them. God, that, that you would, that your grace would capture them and that they would, they would hear about a God who loves them and who treasures them and who treasures the life that, that they've been given. And, and from a place of mercy, not condemnation, from a place of grace and love, from a, from a place where you invite those who are far from you to come near and experience you. God, I, I pray from that place that you would win their hearts, you'd change their minds, and you would bring about life, that you would bring about your goodness to them. God, I pray for the lawmakers and, and those who, who are in support of this, who, who, who celebrate this day. God, I pray that you would have mercy on them. I pray that your grace would win them as well. And that, um, as my fellow pastor Russell Moore prayed, that one day you would so change their hearts by the gospel, but that they would, they would champion life and that they would know um, you, Christ, as the true life giver. God, I pray for those who are in our midst today who have had abortions, who even in, at the mention of that, um, they, they may feel some shame or condemnation. God, I pray that in the gospel, they would know that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus, that you have taken that and that shame no longer lives and that you call them son you, and you call them daughter and you call them clean and forgiven because of your finished work on the cross. I pray that they would operate from that place and that they would have that kind of mercy that reaches out to those locally who are walking through that difficulty. Father, I pray for our youth as they meet right now. God, I pray that you would win hearts and souls, that even as like 11, 12, 13, 14, 15-year-olds, God, I, I pray that there would be no prodigal season. I pray that there would be no need to wander away from you, not because they've become religious or because they've become legalistic or they're fearful, but because you are their great treasure. Father, as we sang in that song, Jesus, you're the one that we love. There's no one we want to turn to. God, I pray that that would be true for all of those who meet with our youth right now and our AC kids, God, that they would just have deep love affairs with you early and often in their life. And God, as we turn to your word now and we begin to study the person and the work of your Holy Spirit, 
I trust that it's, it's through him that we've been praying and worshiping and that you, Holy Spirit, would do what you love to do, that you would be our helper, that you would remind us of good gospel truth, that, that God is for us and not against us, and that, that God is, is uh, one who breaks chains, that, w- that one, one who forgives, and one who um, leans into our future because of what you've done in Christ. So help us now, God, lift our eyes, lift our, lift our heads. May we be encouraged as your word speaks to us through the Spirit. Lord, we pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen. 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 All right. Well, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in John. So if you want to turn there, the, the verse will be up there in just a minute. I just want to kind of orient us to where we're going uh, over the next couple of weeks here. It's actually, be, I think, uh, maybe seven weeks, actually. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing uh, this study. It's called Great Expectations. Great Expectations expectations. And uh, basically, we here at the Avenue Church feel like there's been some clarity to the vision of what God's called us to do. We're calling it Vision 2020, Expect Greater Things, where we're joining in with the Church United movement in our area to see the amount of Christ followers doubled in our time. And and what we want to do is, man, we just want to be a part. We don't want to miss that. Like, you can be a Christian and not be a part of it, but why would you do that? Like, you're going to miss one of the most historic evangelical um, outbreaks, I feel like, in our time. I really do. Um, and, and so, like, you don't want to miss it. We don't want to miss it as a church. And so we're, we're putting it on the line. We're, like, saying, hey, we're all in to seeing the amount of Christ followers double, even in our area, over the next two years. So if that's going to happen, if that's going to happen, we, we need to have, uh, like, a culture— that would support that. We can't necessarily just, just kind of talk about that. We have to have the supporting culture that gets behind that. And, and where does that even come from? Um, and, and Jesus tells us, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works I do and greater, greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. So we're believing that the greater works that Jesus wants us to do is to join him in this, in this rescue and renewal of all creation, in seeing disciples made in the name of Christ. And so um, that's, that's just what we're going to be about. And, and so we said, hey, man, we, we need to have a culture that supports that. Because I looked at two weeks ago, hey, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, and, and we that's actually true, right? You can say you want to do this, but if you don't have the supporting culture, it just goes away. And so we're defining our culture as having four streams to it, and we're going to preach through those streams this week. I'm not this week. That's really aggressive. This year, okay? There's, there's four streams we're going to preach through. The first one is expectation. The second one is hospitality. The third one is empowerment. And then the fourth one is invitation, and I just briefly gave you an overview of those two weeks ago, but we're going to spend weeks on each of those and see how God is shifting us in our current culture to be, to be more of a culture of what I just explained. And so um, the deep dive, the first deep dive is all about expectation and, and um, expecting greater things. Well, where does, where does that um, begin? You have an outline in, hopefully in, in, your, in your pamphlet there, if you, if you want to follow along and, and review some of this at home. If not, that's totally cool. Uh, but but this will kind of walk us through it. Um, it's important that we start at the right spot. Uh, so so when, we talk about, when we talk about expectation, we have to understand that expectation, biblically speaking, is not about what, it's about who. It's not about what you're expecting, it's about who you're expecting upon, okay? So let's make sure that, so that, that we're, we're clear that it's not about the, the metric of seeing the amount of Christ followers double. It's not about seeing 200 baptisms by, by 2020. I mean, that, that's a metric we've put out there. That's what we're shooting for. That, that's, not, that's not where we're hanging, like, our hearts. We're hanging our hearts on the who that could actually make that a possibility, which is, which is the Holy Spirit. It's the person of God. It's really cool. When Jesus leaves us, um, if we could see that next slide. It's a blank, I think, in your, in your uh, bulletin there. Or we need another what? Actually, I gave you the answer in your bulletin. It's not, it's not another strategy. When Jesus left his disciples, this is awesome. When he left his disciples, he didn't leave them with like a six-point strategic framework. 
He wasn't like, this is how you're going to win the world by, this, by these six, three things. He didn't leave them with like an awesome t-shirt making vision statement. He didn't leave them with buildings. He didn't leave them with a ton of cash. He didn't leave them with all the things that you, you think might be necessary in order to keep the vision going. He's like, look, here's what I want you to do. I want you to make disciples of all nations. Here's how you're going to do it. You're going you're gonna to fall in love with God and you're going to fall in love with people. It's like really simple. Love God, love people. Make disciples. Uh, so that, that's kind of like the, the, the vision, the strategy. He left us with another person. He left us with another person. Here, man, at the, at the, at the Avenue Church, at Redemption Church, at Trinity and Seacrest and First Baptist and all the churches in our area and beyond, man, we don't need another strategy. We don't need another Vision 2020 as much as I think, wow, that's really exciting because it brings some clarity. We need another person. And Jesus is really clear about who that person's gonna be. It's gonna be the person of the Holy Spirit. Um, this week, I believe, marks the, uh, marks the passing of someone who had great influence over all of you. You, you may not know this person personally, uh, but, but he was the founder, planter, and then pastor of uh, Spanish River Church. And Spanish River Church is about 40 years, oh, I don't know what it is, maybe 44, 45 years old. And he, he started it and, and he planted it and, and then he led it. Uh, until he transitioned over to another person. So it was a great work. It was a great ministry. It was a great, was a great I'm going to tell you how he's influencing you continually in just a minute. But, but it, it, like, it was a really awesome start that David Nicholas pioneered. But when he left, he didn't leave it to a general strategy or mission statement or something to put on the wall. He had to transition it to another person. Now, that person is Tommy Kiedis, and he's doing a great job, and, and he's, like, seeing the mission fulfilled, and God's been doing awesome work through him. But my point in saying that is whether it's Spanish River Church, whether it's the church in general, whether it's Apple and, and Steve Jobs or whoever it might be, when, when there's somebody who births a new vision and brings something in, and then they have to leave, they, they put some other person in charge specifically to carry on the mission. The church is no different. The person that's been put in charge of the mission that Jesus birthed is the Holy Spirit. This gospel message that you've hopefully become familiar with, and maybe if you're here for the first time, it'll be the first time you hear it. There's a person in charge of that particular message, and it is the person of the Holy Spirit. So if you are here today and you have uh, become accustomed to hearing that you, there's a brokenness about you, that although God created things good and, and the original creation was good and there was great harmony between God and people and between people and, and one another and even within themselves, that broke down with sin. Sin is, is basically the idea that, that God is holding out on you so you're gonna go your own direction. When sin came into the world, it, it broke the relationship that we had with one another and with God. Now we have disunity with God. We have disunity with one another. And God says that, I, uh, listen, I'm perfect, I'm holy, and I'm just. And, and because of who I am and what you've done, I must bring a penalty to this situation. It's a, it's a right consequence. The consequence is, is death. There's spiritual death, eternal death, and physical death. These are three deaths that were not a part of the original creation, but because of our sinfulness, they've entered into the equation, and now we're born in a way where we don't know God the way we should. We're born in a way where we'll eventually die, and, and we're born where, it, where we're going to have to stand before God and give an account for ourselves, and that account is going to be, it's going to be a, a failure because he's perfect and we're not. And we've chosen to commit crime after crime after crime against his heart, against his law. But because God, in his love for us, would not leave us where we found ourselves, he sent Christ, his son. We would try to work our way back to God through religion or through relationship or through any other kind of efforts. It just doesn't work. It always falls up short. But God, in his love for us, would send a substitute, God the Son, Jesus Christ. And his life would be perfect so that when he went to a cross, he would take your sin and he would take mine and he would be crushed in our place. He would suffer the consequences that our sins deserve so that the Father could forgive you, he could forgive me through Christ's death and resurrection. 
so that one day through the finished work of Christ, we could turn from ourselves, our sinfulness, our own patterns, our own desires outside of God and say, Jesus, I'm done with me. I trust that what you have done is enough. I surrender to you. When a person comes to faith in that way, they're forgiven of their sin. They're given eternal life. They're adopted into God's family. They're called son and daughter no matter what their performance record. The only way that happens is that the Holy Spirit allows you to understand yourself as a sinner in need of a Savior. You didn't figure that out on your own. God's Spirit, who he left in charge, is the one who helps you to understand and trust in that. I invite you to do that today by the power of the Spirit if you've never done it. That message, if it's become familiar to you, if it's become sort of the, the, the song of your heart, is a message that David Nicholas week after week after week would share with us so that we would never take a step outside the gospel goodness in our marriages, in our jobs, or in our churches. His influence continues on today, but not through him, through the power of the Holy Spirit that he left in charge. And so what we're going to do is say, hey, this gospel message that we want to see go out in dramatic fashion in our area, who, who is this person of the Holy Spirit? What's he like? What's he do? How can I know him better? And what should my response be as someone who then takes this message under the power of the Holy Spirit to a world that needs that kind of hope of forgiveness and newness? And so um, we're, we're going to spend uh, the first part of this series talking about the, the who of the Holy Spirit, that he's actually a person and not a thing or an it. We're going to talk about his personality, because if, if he's a person, then that means that he has a personality. That means that there, he likes certain things and he doesn't like certain things. That means that you can please him or displease him. It means that he's got a way about him and you should get to know that. And we're going to talk about what, it, what are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I hear that the Holy Spirit has gifts like, yo, hook me up. That's awesome. You should want, like, that's okay. The scripture's like, you can ask. It's okay to ask your good father for good gifts. What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Okay, so you, you, I hear that you, like every believer gets the Holy Spirit, but there's certain, like, can, how do, what does it mean to be, is that different than being filled with the Holy Spirit? And how do you be filled with the Holy Spirit? We're gonna look at that. We're going to do a deep dive on the, the person that we're expecting these great things from because we don't wanna run ahead into any kind of strategy or any kind of vision or anything like that outside of understanding squarely who this will depend upon, which is not me it's not you. It's not how well you share the gospel. It's how we engage with the person that God left in charge, the person of the Holy Spirit. So let's go, man, right? Let's do this. All right, here. So um, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in John 14. This is going to be kind of our anchor verse uh, for today. And this is what Jesus says after he set it up with, uh, with, our, with our vision statement, right? That the greater works, this is, this is where he goes. He says this, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be with you. All right, a couple things here in this passage. A couple things here. Um, so important, if you could go back to the initial... Uh, part, yeah, okay, so if you love me. First part, so this is, this is for believers, okay? If you're not a believer in Christ, if like that whole like I'm a sinner and I need a savior thing doesn't really make sense, if you're finding your meaning for life outside of the person of Jesus Christ, look, you're welcome. That's totally cool. You're welcome here. Like hang out. Like you, we're, we're probably weird to you. We just sang a bunch of songs to an invisible God. I just prayed about a certain thing. And I, so that's cool. Like it's okay to check out weird people. And kind of be like, what, what's, what's up with you? Why? There's something different about, I mean, there was a reason you're here. So what I would say is just like, investigate the weirdness. Like, see what it's all about. And, and we'll just be praying for you and, and just watch out. Because, you know, like the Holy Spirit is famous for winning hearts just like yours. Just like yours. But I want to tell you, this particular passage, it's for those people who have come to that place of loving Jesus. Of saying like, Jesus, you're, you're it. You're my life. And, he, and, and here's... Here's who he's going to introduce to us. You'll keep my commandments. Okay, that's awesome. Because loving Jesus means that we love others. And it means that, that we love God. Okay, and so that's, that's real. So if you want to know if somebody loves Jesus, look at their, their relationships. 
it's, it's pretty, you can, you can just kind of like, you know, they, they're, they're a barometer of one another. And I will ask the Father, okay, and he will give you another helper. That word helper, uh, parakletos in the Greek language. And what it means, you can translate it in a couple of different ways. The, oftentimes, um, traditionally, we've translated that as comforter. Comforter. Um, but, the, but the word comforter, that's back in the King James, like, version, okay? And so you might have grown up with the King James, like, a little, you know, a little bit older version, whatever. Or maybe that's your version right now. Well, I'm not a, I don't, hey, I'm not a version guy. I'm just saying, hey, there's a couple of different ways to look at this word, right? And so if, you, if you're used to seeing this word as comforter, um, the word helper, it's just a little bit of a nuance of that. So comforter works. And, and when, when it means comforter and you're leaning into that aspect of it, um, sometimes we might think, well, this, the, Holy, the Holy Spirit, because that's who he's talking about, is one who's going to come and, and make me feel better because that's what you think comfort is. But the full definition of comfort when it's used in this context doesn't just mean it's going to make me feel better. It means it's going to strengthen me. Like I'm going to receive comfort that actually strengthens me to be able to move forward and, do, and, like, and like eventually do things that I couldn't do without him. So it's, it's not just like, uh, like I'm in the fetal and then he kind of like wraps around me. He's like, it's going to be okay. That happens. That, but it's like, okay, it's a comfort that, that actually pushes you and moves you and helps you to do and become things that you could never imagine. Okay, so that's why we see here in this translation, it's helper. And it's cool because the word another means it's, it's a helper just like me. So Jesus is saying, hey, who I'm going to send to you is going to be just, it's going to be just like me, although different, okay, because it's another, but it's the same type. It's the same type. So what we're seeing right now as we introduce you to the Holy Spirit, and some of you might know the Holy Spirit really well. I was talking to my mom about like this new series. I don't think she could be here today, right? Okay, all right. So you, none of you were like assaulted with a major hug when you came in probably, because that's my mom's, that's, that's her. So, so, but she's like, oh, I love the Holy Spirit. You know what's cool? because I'm going to talk at the end here about having a relationship with the Holy Spirit. You know people who seem to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. It's like when my mom said that, I was like, of course you do. <laughs> if you know my mom, of course you do. And if, and if you talk to people who just seem to have this way about them, you could probably say, so I know you have a relationship with the Father, and I know you have a relationship with, with the Son. I know I talk about that. And th but but do, you, do you feel like you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit? See what they say. See if you get around believers who have a certain way about them that's like super contagious and like joyful and electrifying and just see where they are with the Holy Spirit. I mean, that, so that was just kind of cool to have that conversation uh, with my mom. He's going to give you another helper. So we're beginning to see that the Holy Spirit is actually um, God, just like Jesus is God the Son. This is God the Spirit. We're, we're pretty familiar with God the Father. So it's another so it's, a, it's part of the Trinity, and it's a helper. It's one that's going to comfort, but also, like, move you. It's going to push you. It's going gonna, it's gonna to do something that is connected to the mission that Jesus just said a few verses up. If this was, like, a big electronic Bible, the few verses up is the one that says you're going to do greater works. So if I'm going to do greater works, I'm going to need a what? No, let's try this again. If I'm going to do greater works, I'm going to need a what? Yeah, I'm going to need another person. Because I'm weak, I'm sinful, I'm bent on me. And I'm going to take my Christianity and make it a self-help thing. And see how I can make myself feel better rather than getting on mission and getting uncomfortable and getting dirty and failing and succeeding and failing. And succeeding. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to internalize it. But like I've got a helper who keeps pushing me forward. You need another person if we're going to see the amount of Christ followers double. Trust me. To be with you forever, that's cool because that's different than the Old Testament. So, so I want to introduce you to the, the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit is not going to be someone who comes and goes like we saw in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit is going to be someone who is with us forever. Okay, next part. Even the Spirit of truth. Okay, there we go. He names them. The, this is the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of names of the Holy Spirit, which is a cool study. Whom, we're not going to do it right now. I, I kind of want to, but we're not going to. Whom the world cannot receive, huh, because it neither sees him nor knows him. Okay, so, so when he says the world, everyone's in, invited to, but in, unless you, he's talking about unless you've moved from like the world being your like chief dominion of where you get your source of information in life to the kingdom of God, you, the Holy Spirit's not going to make sense to you. You're not going to be able to receive like what the Holy Spirit has for you. And 
He says, you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. So just to be clear, what we're doing today is identifying the Holy Spirit as a person. It's gonna matter. He's not, a, he's not like a force. It's not like use the force, Luke. It's not like um, a thing. It's not like, a, um, like this. He's, he's an actual person just as much as God the Father is a person and God the Son is a person. That's gonna be important in just, it's important now, but it's gonna be important in just a minute. Check this out. He, personal pronoun, personal pronoun, personal pronoun. You know him. That's, that means that he's got to be a person to know. You've got to be a, per, it's got to be a person that can live with someone and be with you. So we see he, 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 personal pro. It's very clear that at least Jesus thinks that this is going to be a person who replaces him and does even more greater works than what Jesus did if he were to have stayed. That's crazy stuff. It's a whole nother sermon. I'm not even ready to preach that one. Okay, let's keep going on this one. Here we go. Well, what else, what else does he do? Here's what Jesus says about him. Again, identifying him with the Godhead. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, that's God the Father, and of the Son, that's God the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. They're all on the same level. It's not like the Holy Spirit is like this unknown stepchild that kind of gets mentioned here and there. He like belongs with the Son and the Father. So just to, just to let you know, part of my understanding of, of coming up and just, just like this is me, okay, is like, it was like really big on Jesus and really big on the Father and the Holy Spirit was like, I don't know. He's just like, I don't, I don't talk about him a lot because I don't understand him and we don't normally talk about things we don't understand, right? So he, Jesus is inviting, man, if you read the New Testament, he, there is a lot of emphasis on the Holy Spirit. It would be hard, Acts would be a really short book without the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is a major player, like the major player in the birth of the church and in the advancement of the gospel, right? And so what Jesus is doing, when you baptize, what that does is that gives you an identity with each of them. It also gives you access to each of them as people. All one God, three persons. All right, so we're gonna keep moving. I, I, I love what John uh, Walverd says about the Holy Spirit. He says this, a mere influence or emanation does not create, empower, teach, guide, pray, or command. So we're just throwing out the idea that the Holy Spirit is this thing out there. No, he's a person. What's he going to do? He's actually going to teach and empower. He's going to create. He's going to pray. He's going to command. But you shouldn't believe me just because this guy, I can't, I don't even know if I said his last name right. Just because he says it, or because I'm telling you right now, what does the word of God say? That's what you should be saying. Okay, Casey, you're talking about the spirit. Prove it. My son, my son, when he was like eight years old, that's what he used to say all the time when, when you would say anything. And he was so annoying, but he loved it, right? And he got it. He was, it was funny. He, we'd, be, we'd be like, all right, it's time to go to bed. He'd be like, prove it. <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm going to crush you right now. I'm going to totally crush you. And so we used to have this rule. He would say that like throughout the day. Prove it, prove it. And it was kind of annoyingly funny. And um, so we would have this rule that if we proved it, he actually couldn't say that for 10 minutes. It was so awesome. We'd be like, well, we've scheduled. Eight o'clock is your bedtime, whatever. So listen, let's prove this. Let's be a little bit like, hey man, prove it. Awesome, glad you said that. We're gonna, we're gonna do some work through the scriptures here. They're all in your outline, so go home and read these. What does the Holy Spirit do? What does he do as a person? Well, in no particular order, but beginning in Genesis 1, 2, he creates. He creates. When you read Genesis 1, 2, you'll see that the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, intimately involved in creation. He empowers. Zechariah 4, 6. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, not by power, not by my, but by my spirit, says the Lord. God of hosts, like, you're not going to advance outside of my spirit. I'm going to send you my spirit, and he's going to empower you to do what you could not do without my spirit. Isn't that awesome for those of you who are thinking, like, man, I want to be a part of Vision 2020, but I've never shared the gospel. I don't know how to take it from, like, oh, man, can't believe that no call last weekend in the, in the, in the game to, oh, and by the way, you need to save your name, Jesus. Like, that's a big shift, right? <laughs> it's like, I'm building this relationship with my neighbor, we're going to maybe have a Super Bowl party, but I don't know how to go from here to here. Well, guess what? You got a helper that loves to do that. 
He loves to empower you to do things that you've never done before. So you just have to start expecting it. What else does he do? He speaks. John 16, three, uh, 13. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all truth. For he will not only speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. So he's intimately connected in the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He's going to speak things to you. He has a voice. We need to learn to listen. He has a voice. We need to learn to listen. You know my voice. Most of you, if you've been here a while, it's a, probably a bit tinny and annoying. But you know when I'm speaking, right? If you close your eyes, you'd be like, okay, that's not Casey. Maybe that's Sam or maybe that's Mitch. But when I'm up here, I'm fast and I'm, you know, I, I get it. It's not the best voice, but you know it. The Holy Spirit has a voice that you should know if you're gonna have a relationship with him. Next one, he leads, Romans 8, 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Next one, he teaches, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said. He prays, Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. I love that about the scriptures. You never have to pretend to have it together. I love that. As my people. Uh, he says, for, for, for you don't know what to pray for. I love that. Have you ever tried to pray? Just be like, I know I should pray. <sighs> I'm super tired and I'm kind of hungry and um, this just feels annoying. I feel like I'm talking to the roof. Well, that's okay, dude. You're in good company because the Holy Spirit knows that and helps you to pray. It actually prays for you. That's awesome. You, somebody asked me, how's my prayer, prayer life going? I can just be like, oh no, ask the Spirit. It's pretty good pretty good. That's a, that's a little bit of a cop-out, so don't, don't do that. But He convicts. John 16, 8, and when he comes, the Spirit, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So if you understand yourself to be a sinner and like God's holy and righteous and you deserve the, like you, you the scriptures say like weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's, it's what you would, it's where, it's where you would say justice for a criminal. Where we, where, when we see criminal behavior, you want justice. There's, there's spiritual criminal behavior in my heart, even, even this morning. And, and because God's righteous and holy, I deserve hell. I deserve separation from God. The only way I actually really believe that is the Holy Spirit's helped me to understand that. If when I'm saying that to you, you're like, that doesn't make any sense, that's okay. The Spirit, we pray, will help to convict you on that. It doesn't have to be me. It doesn't have to be my message. Um, what else does he do? He commands. In Acts 8, he tells Philip to go over there and speak a word to this guy over there. He just says, Philip, stop, go there. He grieves, Ephesians 4.30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed uh, for the day of redemption. So he has emotion. The Holy Spirit is a, pro why does he have emotion? Because he's a person. These are all things that people, real people do. Not just like some mysterious thing out there. So if he is a real person, then where I am driving today, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, is that he deserves a real relationship. If he is a real person, he is inviting us into a real relationship. There's three sort of, um, I think we have a big list, right, of all these together. Yeah, he creates, he empowers, he speaks, he leads, he teaches, he prays, he convicts, he commands, and he grieves. Those are, he's inviting you to join him as he does what he loves to do. Not just simply be the recipient of it and miss it all the time. Like, I didn't want to miss my daughter getting healed. He doesn't want you to miss all the things that he's doing for you because, check this out, you can't expect great things from someone you don't know. I don't know George Washington, and so I have no expectation for him. As far as I know, he's still dead. Many of us might have come up in, in evangelical circles that think the same thing about the Holy Spirit. I don't know the Holy Spirit. As far as we know, well, I don't think he's dead, but he's kind of a non-issue. Do you think that's a non-issue? Which one of these things do you want to live without? You want to live without God speaking to you? <laughs> that's what's up. 
I was just being quiet because it's weird, right? If God like never spoke to you, it'd be weird. You wouldn't have a relation. I boiled these down into kind of three things, power, voice, and emotion. You can look at all these things. That, the Holy Spirit has power. The Holy Spirit has a voice, and the Holy Spirit has emotion. It was super cool this Saturday, right? And uh, So this Saturday, my wife went to the Unleashed um, women's conference, and it was oh, so awesome. I know some of you went, and, and, and so she left Friday, and that left me in charge. Um, Holy Spirit, come help. And, and it was me in charge with four kids, and we just ran point on that house. It was awesome. And, and so we, we did our thing, and, and so what hap this happens sometimes is, um, and my, my wife hates it, when I'm in charge, it seems like the kids sleep in. When she's there, they're up like a military time. I don't know what happens. It's, I don't know why why that happens, but it just does, right? And so um, I, I had, uh, I, I, invited, I invited my two-year-old in for a sleepover, and I uh, can't say that was a good decision, but I did it. And we were cuddling, and she woke up at like four, so then we went down to the couch, and actually I had already gone down there, and she's like at the stairs, so, I, so, we, so we, we resumed our cuddle on the couch downstairs. And um, what was really cool is normally I'm like a, I think my parents like to call me a chipmunk because I'm all over the place. I'm like, go do this, go do that, go do this. You know, like, I, f I feel like my day's not complete or I'm, sometimes I have this weird, it's not good, pressure to like do and go all the time, okay? I don't know if you can relate to that or not. But I'm like, oh man, horrible dad unless we went to like three parks and a Chick-fil-A. So <laughs> this Saturday morning, I was like, no, it was raining and we were sleeping on the couch. I had given my three-year-old an iPad and told him, you need to stay like in your room. I know that's not a good decision. I understand that. I totally get it. We have parental restrictions on there. He was watching this thing. But, I, but so, all right, you can send me your emails and tell me that's not good. But listen, man, I was enjoying Saturday morning. And so I was there with my two-year-old and we're cuddling on the couch and I'm like fighting this urge to get up and go. Everyone's quiet. My teenagers are just like in the middle of their sleep because they're like, they're gonna wake, they're vampires, right? They're gonna wake up at noon. And so it was, it was my two-year-old and, and she was sleeping and I was cuddling and then she started to wake up, right? And it didn't matter that I was kind of contorted in this situation. Man, I just, I had made the decision, man, I just wanna be with her. I'm, I, I don't, I do a lot of life with her, but I don't, I'm, I, I don't, um, it's gonna come out wrong. It's not good grammar, but I need to say it anyways. Uh, I don't be with her a lot. I know, just fix that in your own mind. But so I, I was there. And you know what was really cool? This is so cool. <laughs> I'm not sure what was all going on in her two-year-old mind, but she started to wake up and she started to um, caress my fingers. And then um, she did something like that to my face. And then she got, you know, and what I have left up here, and she was just kind of, and our, our hair, it's a lot different. She's got beautiful, curly, awesome hair. and Our fingers are different. Our faces are different. And it was like, I felt like God was telling me, she's, she's exploring you because you decided to abide with her instead of do another activity with her. And like she got to know me and the contours of my fingers and the texture of my hair and the feeling of my face in a way that she doesn't when we're always on the go. And I'm thinking if we wanna know this somewhat mysterious person, maybe in your history called the Holy Spirit, we're gonna have to choose to abide with God. We're gonna have to choose to stop bringing God along with us throughout the day and praying and doing all those really cool things. We're going to have to stop the, the pace of our life and figure out a way to like cuddle up with God and feel the contours of his spirit. Begin to touch who this person is because this person has a voice and he has power and he has emotion that he wants to share with you. But oftentimes, we miss it. And so as we close, our team's gonna come out and we're just gonna play a little, little bit of the chorus to, 
to one of the songs we sang. I um, just want to encourage you this week to expect him. Would you, would you join me in expecting him with me? I don't know what that's going to look like for you. I don't know where your couch is that you need to cuddle up on. And by the way, it's not unmanly to set aside time and just abide, cuddle up, enjoy, and touch the contours of, of God. He invites us into that. But one of the first things you have to do is actually expect that he's going to reciprocate. You've got to know it's okay. You've got to know that you're invited into that. And then you've, you've got to expect that you're going you're gonna to maybe hear something you've never heard before. Maybe it's while you're reading his word. Maybe it's while you're having a conversation with, with someone else or even with the Lord. Maybe it's while you're hearing a song. It's okay to expect that you're going to start to, as you abide with him, you're going to start to um, experience more power in your life than you ever have before. That's a really good expectation of the children of the Father who are filled with the Spirit. And, and you should also expect to start to feel what God feels. You should start to feel more broken over the things that break God's heart and more excited over the things that excite God. The Holy Spirit is famous for always making it about Jesus. And so this week, as we look for the power and the voice and the emotion of, of the Holy Spirit, understand that it's, it's always going to lead you to the person of Jesus. And isn't that essentially where we want to lead, lead others? As we close out, I invite our prayer partners to come forward. Just come on down now. Um, encourage you guys to, uh, to grab a book that's been really influential for me in this journey with the Holy Spirit called Forgotten God by Francis Chan. Um, I don't know exactly what it'll look like for you to be still before the Lord, but I do know that no matter what your personality, it is a spiritual discipline to be still, to listen, and to cut out the distraction and din of our world. And as we practice this stillness, this waiting, this being, it is then we can experience deep intimacy and relationship with the Holy Spirit. So why don't we stand for prayer and um, I want to invite you to, if you want to come and um, respond to that gospel message of understanding yourself to be in need of a Savior named Jesus, man, come down today. Like, pray with somebody. Make it, make it public. Make it like, hey, this is the day that my relationship with God starts because I've come to faith in Christ and His finished work. If you want to have a, a greater experience with the Holy Spirit, if like a relationship with the Holy Spirit's a bit foreign to you, man, come and ask God. Jesus said, my Father will give you the Holy Spirit. He'll, he, lo he loves to do that sort of thing. And so it's cool to pray in community and, and just ask, say, hey, I'd like to experience more of the Holy Spirit. Ask these people, they'll put a hand on you and they'll pray that God does that and we can expect him to do that. And so I'm going to close this in prayer, but we're going to play a little bit and we'll have sort of our Atlantic High School altar open for anyone who wants to come down and, and receive prayer in those areas. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, being with us in the person of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, you're very clear that you would send another helper. And even today, I personally, and hopefully us as a family, has, have experienced the help of your Holy Spirit. We want more of you, and we know that the Holy Spirit does that. So would you fill us with your Holy Spirit? And Lord, for those of us who need to... Um, respond to the invitation to be forgiven and, and set free and become a part of the family of God, I pray that they would come forward, that we, they would receive prayer for that in this moment. It would be a day where the heart of God can celebrate that. Lord, we love you and we expect great things this week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Love you guys.